and uh, yeah, so um, once they come, the uh, the sound will be a bit better quality actually on all of the DVDs, and that'll be good. Um, can we have the mic? That way everyone can hear the question. Yep. Yeah. Um, did I hear... Is that right? Is that... Yeah. on? Yeah. Yeah. You might find it's off. Did I hear you say something like, if the heart chakras were both open or connected, and if the situation wasn't loving, then they... He wouldn't even get an erection or something like That's that? That's correct, yeah. Whoop. That's me. I'm going to address that. that. That's correct. Yes. Um, if you're, if uh, the truth is actually in the end, that if every chakra, every chakra point, of course, you've got the the six that are out, and then you've got the seventh, right? So every chakra point, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. So that should be at the throat, by the way. <laughs> but anyway. Um, Yes, uh, the truth is that uh, when our heart chakra is open, or in fact the truth is that when every chakra is open, we won't actually be able to take an unloving action without... without um, so maybe I need to explain more detail. What, if, the, if your connection with God is open, you've got a constant flow of divine love into you uh, from your crown, every other chakra will remain open. And while it's open, you will be unable to actually engage in any unloving transaction with anybody. So what that means is that you will be unable to actually physically engage in any transaction that is unloving while that state remains open. So the reality is you will not ever even be able to get, if it was a male, you would not ever be able to get an erection with any other person other than your soulmate. Does that make sense? So all of those males who uh, want to play the field a bit um, are going to find that they won't even have a desire to play the field. Does that make sense? There's a, they'll only have a desire for one person. And, uh, and, so the, the, and that's the beauty of the way God created our soul. God created our soul in its pristine state that, as, that if the soul is receiving divine love, it's impossible for the soul in that state to actually act out of harmony with the love that it's receiving in any way, sexually or truth or any other way. So, so for example, the, th the throat chakra is a lot about speaking truth. So while I'm receiving divine love, it's impossible for me to actually not, to not continue speaking the truth without stopping the connection of divine love flowing. Does that make sense? So there's this automatic system, this automatic feedback system of you knowing automatically what love is and what love isn't by, by being sensitive to what the feelings are. And it affects every physical organ in your body, including your sexual organs. So, so the truth is you won't even have a desire for anyone other than your soulmate. Right? So it's not, it's not that you won't have a desire at all, because that, that in itself is out of harmony with love as well. But you will only have a desire for the other half of you. And that's the way God created it. So when you're perfectly in harmony with God's love, at that moment too, you will also be perfectly in harmony in all of your connections with every individual. And you will not be able to engage an individual in any way that's unloving. So let's say this individual comes to you and she projects sexually at you. It will just... It won't even enter you, right? So you'll notice the sexual projection because you're aware of everything, but, but you will, it will not enter you, it will not arouse you, you won't feel a connection, you won't pander to it, you won't try and make her feel better, you won't even need to tell her about it even. It will just pass by you completely and you won't feel, you won't feel raped by it or molested by the projection. So all of the negative and positive emotions that might normally occur, what we call positive, by the way, but they're mostly addictive, would occur from that sexual projection, we will no longer actually respond to at all. So if a person comes along and starts telling you a lie, right, which actually closes down their throat chakra as they're telling a lie, and if you can test this with kinesiology, right, you guys 
Where's Gary? I can't see him at the moment. There he is. You've done some experiments, haven't you, when a person telling a lie, the throat chakra just stops immediately. Have you ever done those kind of experiments? It's quite interesting. Yep. Body goes weak straight away, yep, whenever you tell a lie, even if you think it's the truth. Um, and your body, your body will go weak, your throat chakra will close down. And so, so what will happen is you'll be walking around and any person who's telling you a lie, you'll automatically know it's a lie. You don't need to even ask them anything else. You know that what is being said to you is, is a lie, just straight out. Well, while this love is flowing through you, you are automatically sensitive to the truth of everything happening around you at the same time. What if Mike? Microphone? Yep. What if that person believes they're speaking the truth, even though they're saying a lie? Um, well, it depends whether it's an emotional belief or whether it's an intellectual belief. So if the person has an intellectual belief that they're speaking their emotional truth, and yet the emotion in them is completely different, their throat chakra will close down. If the person believes they are telling the truth, and at the same time has an emotional belief that this is my truth, then the throat chakra will remain open. So it doesn't mean that they're telling you God's truth. It just means that they're telling you their truth. Does that make sense? And if you are open to truth, will you recognise that that is not truth? That if you're open to God's truth, remember, and it's only this connection with God that's going to keep you open to God's truth. If you're open to God's truth, you will recognise that that is not God's truth, but it is their truth. If you're, if you're open to God's truth, you will recognise when they're lying about themselves or telling the truth about themselves. <coughs> But you'll also recognise that even when they're telling the truth about themselves, whether it's God's truth or not. Can you see there's four possible permutations? It's like, um, it's either their truth, not their truth, and their truth can either be in harmony with God or out of harmony with God. Does that make sense? And you'll know every one of those circumstances if you have a permanent connection with God. So, so if you don't have a permanent connection with God, the only thing you'll know is whether they're telling their truth or not you won't know whether it's God's truth or not. Does that make sense? And this is why um, most spirits on the natural love path ha are not able to determine what God's truth is. And this is why in the New Age movement in particular, they use the term your truth, my truth. You know, they, they use those terminology because on the, new, on the natural love path, there is no way to determine what is the absolute truth. It's only when you're on the divine love path there, there is a way for you to determine what absolute truth is, and that is by this connection you have with God. Yeah. And that's the beauty of the connection with God, you see. That's why I'm always focusing you back on the connection with God. It's the connection with God that actually gives you the full truth of the universe and not just the truth you want to hear. And it's that beautiful connection that can be maintained. If we can pass a mic uh, up there, Sue, thanks. <coughs> We're just yes, it does. Yep. Can I ask, before you ask your question though, um, can I ask you how, like, what has happened to your throat? Throat cancer, yes. Um, can, I, can you just hold it up closer to, can you, is it actually switched on? Because I just want to get a lot of this if we can. Yeah, that's it. It's a bit better. Yeah. So it was a real gig in the arse, so to speak. Yeah. 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 And this is this is the beauty of our law of attraction in a way. Yeah. Like we can often fool ourselves to believing things are fine. Yeah. 
but, it, but what happens to our body is a perfect reflection of what's really going on at any one point in time. But I got a good lesson, didn't I? Yeah. 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 And, and this can be reversed as well, yeah. of course. Well, um, tomorrow would be good. Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so the instantaneous reversal of years of practice. Is that uh, what you mean? Yeah, but I have a good... Well, I do have a serious question. Yep. I've been working a lot with Gary and I know I've got a lot of anger in me and yep. I have great difficulty in demonstrating that anger. Yes. Um, I mash things at home, but it's like playing a game. It doesn't work. So it's sort of like you bash things, but you're not really in no, the I anger yourself. There. No, yep. I can't get there. Yep. And I've written out a list of judgments. I've done all the things you tell me to do, and yep. it still doesn't work, and I'm getting very, very frustrated. You're getting very, very angry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is good. Yeah. <laughs> but let's... let's uh, one of the things I'd like to speak with you about is why, why, the, uh, why the throat closed down because yeah. it's related to this voicing of yeah. the anger. Yeah. So, so, can I sit down now? Yep, yeah, sure you can. Yeah. So here's you. Maybe your dress might be a bit shorter. but uh, oh, anyway, yeah. Here's you. And this is your throat region here, obviously, that's being affected the most by whatever the problem is. It's your throat region. And, and um, I'm just going to get out of this feedback area. It's the throat region here is very much about expressing your true emotion rather than expressing the emotion that you feel everyone else, including yourself, wants to hear from you. Yeah. Right? So, so, so when I say expressing your truth, I'm not talking about the intellectual truth that you believe inside of yourself but rather expressing your emotional truth. Now, what's happened for yourself is there's been a heavy close down of your desire to speak your emotional truth to people. And, and you, in, in fact, it went so far that you didn't want to even see your own emotional truth, let alone speak it. Does that make sense? So, so what happens then is this area of your body energetically, so if we're talking about the energy system in your spirit body now, this area of your body remains completely closed at that point. And in fact, and in fact inside of you there was an additional desire and that is that other people recognise the emotional truth in you and then they speak it. So you've got also this additional desire that somebody else recognises how you feel and then they voice it for you, right? There is this, I'm saying, there is this feeling inside of you too. And that's what created your cancer, actually, of the throat. So there's two sides to this story. One is that you personally are quite distant from the emotional truth of what you feel in terms of speaking that to others. And then the second thing is a requirement on the world around you then to recognise what's going on for you and act upon that or speak that for you. And that's the second half of the problem. So there's two sort of avenues or two emotions that need to be dealt with. The first one you're willing to actually accept. The second one you still want to deny, which is the reason why you can't feel it even in yourself. So first thing to do in, in terms of looking at this from an emotional perspective is, one, always... Say, and I'll put this in quotations for you for a moment, because obviously it's now difficult for you to say what you feel because of not having the voice to speak. But always say what you truly feel. And that is very, very different to what the New Age movement would tell you you should be feeling. And that's very, very different to what a group of spirits would tell you you should be feeling. And that's very, very different to what everyone else around you wants to hear. Yeah. Right? And so when you say, and in your case, you can easily start to address this issue by writing what you feel, like rather than just saying it. So you can start writing, what do you feel? How do you feel about things? Now, you are right. There is, the, there is an anger layer here that Gary has been trying to help you to get to. But, but we've got to look at the blockages to the emotion if the emotion isn't automatically being engaged, 
then there must be a block to it. Does that make sense to you? So, so if there is anger in you and you've done muscle testing and everything and, and you can see, yes, there is anger in me, but when I go home and bash, 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 no anger comes up and it just feels like I'm playing a game, yeah. then what we've got to do now is say, all right, let's give up on trying to express the anger for a moment. So just give that up for a while and ask yourself, what are the blockages to your anger? What are your belief systems about anger? So what are some of them? One of them is that it's not spiritual, right? Yeah. That it's just not spiritual to be angry. Yeah. Um, but another one is if I say what I feel, in this case, if I say and express my anger, what will happen to me? What's going to happen to me? People won't like me. Yes. yes. And so the addiction is... I if, need to be liked, to be loved. Yes. yes. Okay, but let's go further with the addiction. Yeah. If, if I need to be liked or to be loved before I'll express myself, then what I'm actually doing is I'm actually projecting at the world around me that all of you have got to love me before I'm willing to tell you my truth. That's really what I'm saying. Now, logically, that's never going to happen because no one in the audience, there's going to be always people in the audience who don't agree with me. But... But if I have to be loved before I speak my truth, then, I, then I'm going to wait for everyone to love me before I speak. Does that make sense? And if I'm waiting for everyone to love me before I speak, my block is, while I'm waiting, I'm just going to sit there not speaking any truth, waiting for everyone around me to get to a point. And, and in a way, it's almost blaming them for not speaking my truth. Can you see that? It's almost saying, it's almost putting the responsibility on them. Uh, the reason why I can't tell you the truth is none of you want to hear it. That's really what we're saying. Right? I, don't, I don't want to tell you the truth. None of you want to hear it. But that's not a good excuse for you not to tell your own truth. Does that make sense? Even if no one wants to hear. So, so my suggestion is to look, at, look, look more sincerely at the reasons why you don't want to tell the truth. Does that make sense? And that you, you don't even want to tell the truth, let alone feel the truth. So if you have anger in you, for example, if you start expressing your anger, which is what you need to do to the people who, you know, created a lot of this anger, which obviously some of them have passed now, right? But, but you can still express it. And, and when I say express it, I don't mean live in it and rage and scream at them. What I mean is say, I'm actually very angry with you because actually when I was little... And you, like, Mum, when I was little, this is what you did with me. You shut me down here, you shut me down there, you made me do this, you fall. And you start expressing, just, you don't even have to feel your anger yet, just ex express it. Now, you can write it. I've already done that, AJ. Yep. I've been through all that. So why aren't you allowing yourself to feel it then? I have no bloody idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, so what I'm suggesting to you is that you are addicted to waiting to, for somebody else to give you the approval to do it. That's what I'm suggesting to you. In other words, everyone here has to want to hear it before you will speak it. Does that make sense? Everyone has to want to hear it first, and then I'll do it. And that's an addiction, because that's making my speaking of the truth now reliant on every other person here. I don't like that answer. No. We usually don't like to hear our addictions. Um, but, but it's the addictions that drive most of our behaviour. So the addiction is, I know, for example, that if I start telling my truth, half of you are not going to like me. Right? So, so I'm not going to be loved if I tell my truth. So what do I do? I learn that I'm not allowed to tell my truth. I just won't tell it. I'll wait till you all love me before I tell the truth. But in the end, that turns into addiction in my, in, my, in my older age of now I'm expecting all of you to love me before I'll even open up and be myself. And the truth is, actually, that no one is going to love you until you open up and be yourself. Do you see? How can they love you? Because you're actually not being yourself. And how can they love someone who's not being, having integrity with themselves? So, so often we're trying to do something out of an addiction to get a certain action that is impossible to achieve. And in your case, 
the action is, everybody love me and then I'll tell you the truth. And there's a bit of anger in that, obviously, isn't there? Like, you've all got to love me first. You, you naughty person, you didn't love me there, you didn't love me. You know, there's that kind of feeling. I honestly don't feel that about everybody, only probably about two people in my life, my mum and my dad. <laughs> yeah. can, can, I just, yeah. can I just deconstruct a, an untruth for you? Right. Here's your dad. Here's your mum. If you feel something towards your dad and your mum, you, every male is going to be the object of your dad's stuff and every female is going to be the object of your mum's stuff. So that means that there's 3.4 billion men that you feel the same way about as you feel about your dad and there's 3.4 billion women around about that you feel the same way as you do about your mum. And it's very important to see that. It's not, so when you say to me, oh, it's only about dad and mum, yeah. you're really saying, actually, no, this is about every man and woman yeah. on the planet. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, and it is yeah. about that. So how to fix it? So how to fix it first, I've already said, and that is to understand the addiction exists, that you want every male and female, and it's a bit different with male and female at the moment. You are more... Uh, it, it, the, the feeling I have is the problem from you is the problem is more with females than even males, like to tell the truth. You're a bit more willing to tell the truth with men than you are with women. But there is still the requirement that they love you before you do it. Right? That they actually must have a good feeling. Of, you must have a good feeling from them. They must want to know you before you'll speak the truth. Right? And you need to give this addiction up. And the way you give an addiction up is you firstly usually get angry that it's not happening and then you get into your grief about the fact that nobody here wants to love you. Because nobody here wants to listen to you. So they don't want to love you. And you let yourself grieve that. Now I'm not saying that's the truth. Yeah, I know. But that's the feeling you have from your mum and dad. Yeah. Your mum and dad basically were people who just wanted you to remain completely verbally invisible. That's how they felt about you, right? They wanted you to stay in that state, right? And then, and that's, and that's the, one of the biggest issues you face, obviously. And that creates this flip side addiction. All of you must love me before I will actually speak to you. All of you must love me before I'll tell you the truth about me. So what I'm suggesting is tell the truth about yourself. Write it down, even to yourself. Start telling the truth about yourself. Start telling the truth about how much you've been closed down by mum and dad. Tell the truth to mum and dad, you know. Write a letter to them even though they've passed. Write a letters to them. And if they're here, they, they're passed, both, they're both have passed. Yeah. So write letters to them and read it out. Say, mum and dad, I want you to come here and you listen, have a listen to this. Right? And read out the letter you've written. This is how I feel you shut me. You know, be, start speaking the truth about these things. Now, the, the problem with the, the thing you're facing is that you've also attracted a spirit who doesn't want you to speak the truth. So they don't want you to know, that, that to actually verbally communicate how you really feel either because they are just as frightened as you are. And one thing you're not acknowledging is how frightened you are of actually speaking the truth. There's a terrible, terrible fear in you about this, like... It's just an intense fear about speaking the truth. And that's it. Now you're connecting with that emotion. That's it. It's beautiful. That's beautiful. Just allow yourself to connect to the fear you have, how frightened you are. And, and can you see this is related to punishment as a child about speaking the truth, about telling mum and dad how you feel and all those kind of things? So allow yourself to connect with that emotionally. I told the truth. Yeah. yeah. All, every time, pretty yeah, much. I yeah, I did. Yeah. So, so you need to allow yourself to feel, firstly, how terrified you are about speaking the truth. And it's this terror that you have. That's it. Allow yourself to feel it's beautiful. And that's it. And it's this terror that you have about speaking the truth that has closed down this part of your body. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just let yourself feel it. By the way, there's a room out the back here if anybody wants to go out there. There's a room where you can turn on heaters if you want to process things rather than stay if you, want to, if you don't want to stay. 
the beauty of all of our body responses is they tell us the truth about what's really going on for us. That's the beauty of it. And when you connect into that, you will always connect into the emotion. And the truth is, when you do that and you allow the grief to flow, the anger automatically dissipates anyway. Does that make sense to everyone? The anger is there due to frustration and other, other issues. Yeah. Oh, you want to... Um, I'm wondering whether my stuff is a bit similar. I've felt of a, of a feeling... Well, yours is similar, but, okay. but can I just clarify yours? Yours is specifically with women. So, um, I don't know the lady, lady's name. Kay, Kate, was it? Kay. Kay. Kay's um, issue was with both mum and dad. Both mum and dad really shut her down heaps and caused her to really feel like she couldn't speak her truth at all, punished her for speaking the truth. And there's obviously anger about that and then the underlying grief about that. But in your case, yours are, your problems with speaking the truth have a lot more to do with women than men. So while you sometimes don't speak the truth to men, you more often than not have a difficulty speaking truth with women. And I'm not saying speaking the truth that you think you know, I'm talking about speaking the truth of your feelings and emotions to women. How do you feel about women, really? At the moment, you feel that they're really beautiful and you'd really like them and, and all that, right? But underneath all of that is, ah, if I don't think they're really beautiful, then they won't like me and they won't love me. They never really love me properly and there's a lot of those kind of beliefs underneath that you're unwilling to express. Does that make sense? Well, like, and you just shut that down. Like, so what you do, well, and a lot of men who are conciliatory men, um, there's a few of you in the group here in COFs, right? <coughs> a lot of you who are conciliatory men will actually conciliate to the woman and therefore you stay in the layer of truth above your real feelings. The, the, the underlying real feelings are, I've got to work hard to have a relationship with a woman. A woman's never really going to love me for who I am. The woman's only going to love me, you know, if I do exactly what she wants me to do. Right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> the woman's only going to care about me. She's only going to have sex with me if I get everything else right. And, and, and things like that, right? So, so this, this, and as men, we learn one or two behaviours from that. One is we get in a rage with women and we treat women quite badly, and then we finish up attracting a heap of women who are uh, okay about getting treated badly. Or we do the other path, which is we consi be conciliatory, 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 always trying hard, always trying harder, 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 harder. And for some reason, every one of those women that we try hard with, they finish up leaving us, and then we get an attract another woman that we try hard with. And in both cases, I, the, both the demanding, angry man and the conciliatory man is not a place of love. And it's our false beliefs. Remember we said at the start of this discussion, it's our false beliefs about love that we're wanting to release. Because that's the things that are preventing us, connecting with God and connecting with everyone around us in a pure way. And, and causally, um, how can I work on that? All right, so, so let's look at the addiction. What's the addiction? Uh, to be loved by the woman? No, I would say that's an underlying emotion. The addiction is... Does that make sense? That's your addiction. Yeah. The addiction gives you what you want. What does the addiction give you? Well, well then it gives me love from the woman. All right. Love, quotation marks, shall we say? Yeah. That's what it gives me from women. From. The truth is it's not love because if I have to work for love, it's no longer a gift and therefore it's not love. Does that make sense? Quite simple. If I have to work for love, then what I'm getting from another person is not love. So, so we need to bear that in mind. Love is always a gift. Love is a gift that's given for no reason. Uh, you know, oh, you made me a lovely meal tonight. I love you so much. No, you love the person whether they make you a lovely meal or not. 
Do you see what I'm saying? Like, so so if, what you're doing is you're interpreting that when a, when a woman loves you, she will give you things, right? And that you have to earn those things. So the addiction is the earning, the pleasing of the woman. That's the addiction. And the underlying emotion that you're looking for is love from a woman. So what's the underlying causal emotion that you need to feel? The lack of love from a woman. No woman loves you, Paul. None. How does that feel? Not a woman your entire life has really loved you. Yeah, well, I, I guess I felt like a burden to my mother, you know, that... Um... Not only did you feel like a burden, you were a burden. Do you understand? Yeah. See, 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 we often tell ourselves we feel something, but the truth is, the reason why we felt it as a child most of the time is because exact's exactly what we were, right? The truth is, yes, you were a burden to your mother. That's why you had to try to get her love because she wasn't already giving it. If she was already giving you love, do you think you would have tried to earn it? Would you try to ever earn something that you're already getting? Of course you wouldn't, right? Because you're already receiving it. So the whole reason of why you've got to earn woman is because you know you've not been loved by your mother at all. That's the feeling you have. And it's not just a feeling, it is the truth. Because if, if it wasn't a truth, your mother would have loved you and you'd never have this feeling. Do, do you follow me? So, so your mum can claim to you all she likes, and I'm sure she does, that she loves you and she thinks you're a wonderful man, but at the end of the day, she does not love you because if she did love you, you would have felt loved when you were a child and therefore you wouldn't have this addiction. Right? So, so you want to please the woman to get the love from the woman and the emotion underneath is, I need to feel no woman loves me. No woman in my entire life, actually, for you has actually loved you? Perhaps, perhaps one. <laughs> and can you see why you want to say perhaps one? Why is that? Well, but because I, I feel like I know my soulmate and we had a short relationship and I'm, and I'm thinking that was real love. But, but you attracted her by pleasing her. Okay, so, so our interactions weren't loving. Okay, how can they be? You were still in the pleasing mode of pleasing women, earning love. So that means you, even if she is your soulmate, what, what does it mean? That she has the opposite injury, that she wants the man to please her before she will give him love. Mm -hmm. Same injury. So the truth is no woman in your life up to now, and in fact you can't right at the moment with this emotion ever attract a woman who actually loves you. Yeah. yeah. You're not feeling it. <laughs> I was feeling it. <laughs> can you see how quickly you're trying to get out of it? Yeah. Like, I can feel this inside thing going on inside of you, just like, oh, don't tell me that, you know, like, no, no, I don't believe that. So, see, I've, I feel I've been working on this for quite a while, mm -hmm. you know, um, for, for a lot of hours, really. Um, but can you see that you still try to please women a lot? Yep. Well, that's you in the addiction. To, to actually get out, get a causal emotion out of you, you've got to stop your addictions. Does everyone get that? Like, yeah. like if you were a smoker, like just imagine you're puffing away 20 of them a day or 40 of them a day, right? And, and you want to get to the underlying reason why you're smoking, right? You want to actually feel the underlying reason inside yourself why you're smoking. Is continuing to smoke going to expose the underlying reason? Isn't it going to deaden the underlying reason? Can you see that? Right, now this is the trick with our emotional addictions, you see. With our emotional addictions, because they're harder to notice that they're damaging us, what we finish up doing is we don't stop the addiction. We continue the addiction. So, so in your case, I've seen you with groups of people while I've been here just in short visits, and the women will automatically come to you and you automatically please them, and it's actually quite a strong, pleasing emotion coming out of you. Some of them are... How many of you ladies are repelled by Paul's pleasing you? Oh, isn't that interesting? No one. <laughs> how many of you think Paul's just a wonderful, such a wonderful man that... I'm sorry, but is, is this okay? How many of you feel Paul's such a... Yep, so four or five. How many of you feel 
the projection from Paul, I've got to please you, I've got to please you. How many of you notice that the projection? Okay. Do you address it with him? No, because you like getting pleased. Can you see that? So, so Paul's lovely projection goes into you and you go, oh, there's a man who wants to please me. Oh, I like these kind of men, right? <laughs> these kind of men are rare. <laughs> like, so, so what I do... <laughs> So what I do then, what do I do? I just get hooked straight into that and I don't tell him, actually, Paul, you're trying to please me. You're sacrificing yourself to please me here. And you don't even see that happening, you know? And you don't expose it with him. Why? Because you don't love him enough, actually. You see? You're willing to take the addictive emotion from him without addressing it in him. Like, he, he's not loving himself doing this to you, all of you. Girls, he's giving out, giving out, giving out, giving out to all these women. It's going to be very competitive when your soulmate comes along, isn't it, again? You're already giving the you know, 50 or 60 other women in an emotional way in order to feel the feeling of being loved. So how's your soulmate going to feel with that? Can you see it's all a bartering system that's going on? Oh, yeah, I can see it's no good. For yeah, sure. it's no good, right? So... so you're feeling the please women every single time. And this is where responsibility comes to play. Notice yourself pleasing the woman. Because to be frank with you, the women are going to love it. And they're going to want that from you. That's their addiction. Does that make sense? Having a man, a good man, please them is their addiction. Right? So let yourself feel. And you need to notice. You need to. Not them. You need to notice. And it's great if you have an honest woman around you who will tell you. But... But you need to notice, I'm pleasing again. Here I go again, in my addiction. Stop your addiction immediately. Sit down, fold your arms and your knees and keep yourself in the prison <laughs> of not to please a woman. I'm not going to please a woman. And feel the emotional reason why you just tried to do it. Why did I just try to do that? What was I feeling? And you'll find that many of the women you're trying to please are quite angry with men which is very similar to my mother. Right? They have a latent underlying anger with men and the only men they accept in their life is a man who will please them. Right? So this is something to work on for yourself and Gary <laughs> too. <laughs> I'm sorry to point that out. But this is <laughs> right? And many of you other men in the audience have the same emotion. This is why how the law of attraction works, right? The law of attraction often brings men together who have a very similar emotion with women. And, and allow yourself to feel every time I'm pleasing a woman. Now, I'm not saying don't please the woman because when you give love as a gift, you give it as a gift from your heart. But at the moment, you're not doing it as a gift. You see, you're doing it for a result. And the result is the woman will think I'm a great guy and love me. Does that make sense? Whereas when you're actually loving people as a gift, you don't expect the result because you've healed inside of yourself the desire for the result. So at the moment, the desire for the result from the woman is, please love me, please love me. I don't feel loved unless you love me. You know? and, and most women don't want to give you that gift. And instead, you have to earn it. And so how do you earn it? By the addiction. So the first course of action is to notice the addiction and stop the addiction, just like you would with smoking. Notice the addiction and stop the addiction. I, also, um, with my shyness with people and fear of people, is, if, if I deal with this, will that clear a lot of that as well? Well, your shyness is more like with both genders, isn't it? Yes. rather than just with one gender. So it's a different causal emotion. Does that make sense? Yes. But one of the reasons why you're quite shy is because you're very, you're very sensitive to other people's emotions. You know what they're feeling. Right? And when, quite often what you get from other people is quite like harsh emotions and, and you don't want to engage them for fear of what they will do with those harsh emotions. And that creates a lot of shyness and reserve inside of yourself. Often, by the way, again, shyness is not actually shyness. It's a fear of the other person's response to you. Yeah. Right? Mm. So let's call it what it really is. I'm afraid mm. of something. What am I afraid of? Yeah, I'm afraid of people's 
I'm afraid of how people will see me. You're afraid of being seen? Yes. Are you really? Oh, well, afraid of rejection. Afraid of people being unhappy with me. Yeah, so you're not afraid of them seeing you. You're afraid if, if they see you and then they're unhappy with you, what they'll do with that. Does that make sense? Yes. So go further in a lot of these feelings. Like, like, don't just say, oh, I'm afraid of people seeing me, because that yeah. doesn't really tell you much at all. Mm. I'm afraid of people seeing me and then rejecting me, like thinking that I'm bad or whatever, and then rejecting me. That's, that's the close. And underneath that fear is an emotion. What's the emotion? I'm afraid of feeling the feeling of being rejected. Mm. So that's telling me what a feeling I'm avoiding. I'm avoiding being rejected. Mm. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So every one of these feelings, like pleasing woman, tells me what I'm avoiding. You know, I want love from the woman. It tells me what I'm avoiding. Every, everything we identify does tell us what we're avoiding and all we need to do is pray about that particular thing we're avoiding. But while you continue the addiction, it is highly unlikely that you'll actually get to the causal emotion. Uh, it's like the smoker. Uh, you know, he's smoking away, ten pack, you know, he's two packs a day. Do you think he's going to easily give up smoking if he continues trying to smoke his two packs a day? Of course not, right? And he can deal with 25 emotions, but it's highly unlikely he'll deal with the emotion that causes him to smoke. Right? Because the addiction is being satisfied by the action. So every time you please the woman, your addiction is being satisfied by the action. And so therefore, because they give you a feeling, oh, we love you, Paul, you're such a wonderful man, aren't you beautiful? Give us a hug, you know, you're so nice, man. This happens to you all the time, right? But none of them want to seem to have a relationship with you that's loving and equal. And this is the reason why is because it's not love. And, and working through this, I'm wondering, you know, like my fear of people is a fear of them being um, angry with me or hating me. Yes. Um, to deal with that, I'm wondering about processing, you know, people being angry with me or like you've done sitting in shopping centres in public places and that and feeling that. But go further than that. This is about, again, dad and mum feeling feelings of hatred and rage towards you. How does that feel, Paul? Like, little kid, yeah, see, straight, see how when you state the truth, emotion, instant, instant emotion. This is very important to understand. Every time the truth is stated to yourself, your emotion will flow instantly, you know, and we need to state it as it is. We need to be blunt about the emotion. So the emotion for Paul is mum and dad did hate him, right? And he felt that projection from them a lot of his life, mum in particular, right? Because mum, you know, mum didn't want him around and all these other things. And, and, and we can intellectualise about it, but as soon as you state the truth, the emotion just flows. Right? That's the beauty of your, of your internal system. Once you hit the truth, it'll be instant. Yeah. Is that helpful? You can feel that. Um, Come down to Karina. Um, AJ, we're talking today about truth and error. And I have a deep error with self love and the shame and an addiction to make myself wrong. And I seem to do all the work I can on it. And I, I don't know if I'm moving. I'd like some help, please. Um, Karina, the reason why you're not moving on it is because it's not the emotion. I'd like the truth then. Do you really? Yeah. Because I'll... you've been getting the truth for quite some time from Mary and rejecting it. Well, this is where I'm in error. So I... You notice how the tears stop straight away? Can I just point out to you that those tears were the crocodile tears we were talking about okay. earlier? Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so, and this is the problem with us sometimes, is we get addicted to the emotion so that we can avoid, sometimes, the underlying causal emotion. Right? Mm -hmm. So let's look, at it, let's look at the real thing that's going on for you. So what's the real thing going on for you? There's a desire for what? 
this is where it's going to be very hard for you because, um, again, I'm going to be quite blunt. Does that make sense? I need that, I think, because if I'm not picking it up and you've been trying to help me, I need, I need blunt, probably. But Mary has already been quite specific with you about what the emotion is. But it's because a woman, you can't hear her. Um, I because she's a woman, you're not hearing her. So okay. let's look at some issues here. One, a woman is showing me what the emotion is and I reject it. I'm not hearing. I'm, I'm not even hearing. Like it's not even going into my soul. Right? What do you, who do you think that's with? Who my do you mother. think that's about? My mum. mother. How, do, how is your relationship <laughs> with your mum? Yeah, straight away, see? <laughs> so how is your relationship with mum? Mum was very, very damaging with you. And so now, any woman speaking the truth to you, you instantly want to, oh, I don't want to even hear that. I'll block with that. Now, if you can deal with this issue of the blockage with your mother, like if you can just allow yourself to feel how your mother truly treated you, what will happen is you will be open enough emotionally to hear what Mary is saying to you and you'll find out that she is actually right about what's going on inside of you about the desire for prominence emotion. Does that make sense? Which is the other emotion that you've been trying to work on. So, so you've, you told me that you felt very unworthy. Actually, I'm saying to you, no, there is a desire for glory and prominence in you. Mm. Right? And that's very different to an emotion of unworthiness. That's a projection at the universe that I want you to recognise me. I want you to notice me. Now, that comes from childhood of not being recognised. But can you see how you have it in particular with males? Right? You want the males to recognise you in particular, more so even than the females. You're willing to even compromise your own sexuality for that to occur. In the past, I'm talking. Right? So, so look, look at this issue with the woman firstly. The woman is, whenever I hear the woman, it's like the woman's not even speaking. <laughs> The, you know, the woman's not even speaking to me. It's like, it's like if she's telling me some truth. And this is how it was with your mum. You just have blanked. You don't want to hear what she's got to say. And the reason why is because she said some pretty bad things and done some pretty bad things that you don't want to feel about. Does that make sense? And you know that. Yeah? And you can easily work through this if you allow that emotion to just flow in you. Yeah? It's, it's just quite, it'll quite easily flow. Mary wants to say some additional thing too. Just um, similar to what you were saying to Mel about when you're processing and there's still a projection coming out of you, you're not going to clear the emotion. Mm. So, uh, Karina, I feel you're getting stuck in processing, but the, the projection is still coming out of you. I want the approval. I want these things. And because of that, you're not just connecting with the really deep grief that's there. So Does if you imagine this is you, Karina, sorry about the uh, perspective. And um, what, ha what is happening at you? When you're feeling your grief, this is what is happening. You start feeling your grief. At the same time, there's some blocking parts in you with your grief where you expect others to hear and notice and take value your grief, right? So what's going out to the world is this projection of, like, I'm feeling grief here. All of you need to understand. <laughs> I'm feeling grief here. Don't you see I'm feeling grief here? Like, that's, that's the projection going out to the world. Is it? I've, I've hammed it up a little, so... So, you, but you can feel that in you, right? I'm feeling grief here. Don't notice this. Notice it. Look, look at me. I'm feeling grief here. Now, that is preventing you from truly feeling your grief. Because that is a demand to other people that they share in your grief. And, and nobody else here, firstly, it's unwise for anybody to share in anybody's grief for a start. But secondly, it's impossible for me, the way God built your soul and mine, is that it's impossible for me to share your grief. It's totally impossible. I cannot get your grief out of your soul and put it into mine and share it with you. All I can do is, is feel my own grief when you're feeling yours. Does that make sense? 
So, so no matter what action I take, I am never going to be able to share in your grief. And you want people to share your grief and your pain. And, and while you have that addiction, you are not going to feel the causal emotion completely and release it. Does that make sense? While you have the addiction that other people share in what you've got going on. And this is a very important lesson for everyone who wants to feel their emotions. While you're wanting everyone else to share with you in what you're going through, you are never going to completely go through what you're going through. It's only when you realise that you are totally alone in this, no one else in this universe can actually feel this emotion that's inside of you now. This emotion is in you and only you can feel it. Only you. No one else can do it for you. No one else can make it happen for you or anything like that. This is what you need to come to terms with. At the moment, you're wanting others to share the process with you. And that is a projection to them that also prevents you from ever feeling the causal emotion completely. Yeah? So you haven't noticed me ringing you up saying, oh, I did this last week and I felt that last week. And in fact... Not a single person I've ever spoken to knows what I felt last week, aside from the person who watched me do it. Right. And that's what it means to own your emotion, to feel it completely yourself. You are alone in this, and when I say alone in this, only you can feel the emotion. God's with you through the entire process, but only you can do it. Only you. And many of you believe that you can't. But I'm saying to you that God actually made you so you can. But he actually made you so that only you can do it. That nobody else can do it for you. No and one. Does that make sense? Ac yeah. And actually that's quite a gift that God has given us. Because at the end of it all, we'll have a sense of, wow, I did that. I did that. Yeah. It's the part of the way God creates us to become who we truly are. If God did it any other way, then we... We might reach at one minute, but we'd think, oh, I have to have all my sisters and brothers here with me. Because <laughs> so they, all, wants they us, all got me here. You God know? wants us to become the beautiful individual who's confident and loves themselves. And mm. that's part of that gift. Yeah. yeah. And you'll actually, in the end, enjoy this process. Because at the moment, we, we often don't enjoy the process because we don't realise the gifts we're getting by fully involving the process, being involved in the process. And when we're projecting out to other people to, to feel what we're feeling, we are not personally fully involved in the process. And it's only when we're fully involved in the process that we will actually start getting a closer relationship with God. Because right? this bond, bond between you and God will intensify so much that, that you know and you can feel God in you, God's love in you, entering you. And you'll know that you created this relationship through your desire. Nobody else like, did it for you. People helped you in the sense of showed you what to do, talked to you about it and all these other things, but nobody else did it for you because only you could do it. Only you can. Yep. And you need to give up the idea that other people can do it for you because they can't. How does that feel? It makes you feel alone, terrified, all these other emotions, which are all emotions that are in you already, allowing, and then you need to allow them if you want to get closer to God. Does that make sense? Just be careful of sharing your emotion with groups of people. Right? If it's for the purpose of helping them or teaching them, then do it. But if it's for the purpose of wanting from them validation or commiseration, then you need to stop the addiction. Otherwise, you will never get to the bottom of the emotion. Yeah? And that's, that's why, like, how I've gotten to the bottom of my emotions by myself, not expecting you to help me get to that bottom of that emotion, not expecting even you to tell me what it is. I've never asked you what my emotions are. Does that make sense? Because I haven't had that expectation of you. I want to take total personal responsibility for everything inside of me. Which includes meaning that I am only responsible for 
analysing and feeling and, and, and actually working out what's inside of me. Um, uh, some time ago in Brisbane I gave a talk about personal responsibility. Um, my suggestion is have a really good listen to that talk about personal responsibility. Because without personal responsibility, you will always be projecting onto others that they share in your experience. It's lovely to get people together who share the common goal and the tr common truth, but if you expect people to share in your common experience, you are way out of harmony with love in that moment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Rachel, if we can go across, just with the mic you've got there, James. <coughs> feeling as well of projecting and does that mean God as well I mean when I'm I feel like when I'm in those deep emotions that I'm projecting this like need or want to God like and it doesn't feel you know it feels like that actually and I'm wondering yeah the same thing applies with the projection to God um, when when you fully are wanting to feel your own emotion you will not project a desire for God to take the emotion away from you the irony is, at that moment, because you are now experiencing the emotion completely, that is the moment that God can help take the emotion away from you. Does that make sense? It's like, that's the, that's the irony of the whole thing. You see, see if, if I'm not feeling the emotion completely, then I'm blocking the emotion. My will is blocking the emotion. And it's the use of my will that I need to address when I'm blocking my emotions. So if I'm expecting God, and this is where a lot of the false beliefs came from, by the way, of Christianity. A lot of the false beliefs developed because everyone wants somebody else to take away their emotion. Everyone wants somebody else to make things better. And so all these projections at me that I get constantly, that I took away the sin of the world, now in a way I have, but only by teaching the truth. I can't take away the sin of the world in, a, in an active sense, because only the person can feel their own sin. Only the person can feel their own disharmony with love. No one else can. So every time that I'm projecting at God, you take this away from me, I am actually in that moment trying to get away from feeling that emotion completely. Does that make sense? What I need to do is be willing to feel the emotion completely now in that moment, God can automatically help the process because I'm not using my will to block the emotion anymore. Does that make sense to everyone? That's the irony. Right? And it's when I learn to feel all of my emotions completely without reserve and without expectation, that's the time when you will ironically progress the fastest because that's the time when God can assist you with the process because now your will is fully in harmony with dealing with this emotion. Up until that point, we dribble this out and we dribble that out and we dribble this out and this is why it is painful on the earth sometimes dealing with emotion because we've got so many addictions in play, so many bartering systems in play, so many bartering systems even with God in play. You know, I'll do this for you if you do... <laughs> You know, how much of us, are, we've got all these bartering systems in play, you see. And because we've got bartering systems in play, we're not completely feeling the emotion. And because we're not completely feeling the emotion, we're using our will to block our own emotion and therefore using our will to block God's emotion to flow through us as well. Does that make sense, Rachel? Yep. So it's really, really important. And it's not something that's going to come instantly. Because to be frank, the majority of us have spent the majority of our life blocking our emotion. So it's not, we can't go from blocking our emotion all the time to never blocking our emotion in one foul swoop. You know, like we can't do that. It's going to be a, a note, oh, here I am blocking in, here I am, and noticing the reasons why I'm blocking. We can't swing from one to the other instantly. So we need to be patient with ourselves. Does that mean, love ourselves through the process? You know, smacking yourself whether it's physically or, or verbally or, or emotionally, is not going to be loving yourself through the process. So st stop berating yourself for not getting it and just allow yourself, oh, there's another block. Oh, there's another block. Oh, wow, well, I have this blocket. Oh, I have this blocket. You know, and allow yourself to feel those blockages and release those because eventually you'll get to the point 
And the moment you get to the point where you're feeling all your emotions at the same time and longing for divine love, ironically, that will also be the moment you become at one with God. And from that moment on, you will no longer block any of your emotions. And you'll no longer have any tools that you block. And everyone around you will notice that you're not blocking anything anymore. Yeah? Your body will feel great. You'll grow a bit younger, lose a bit of grey hair, <laughs> and everything will start working better even in your own body. Right? Your body will start working better automatically because there's no longer these suppression areas. So at the moment, I was saying to the guys who were staying with us this week, at the moment I've got about 15 areas where I'm blocking emotion right now that I'm conscious of. So while I'm speaking to you, there's 15 areas that I'm blocking emotion. And, and I need to learn to start looking at why I'm blocking that one. Why am I blocking this one? Why am I blocking that one? And I need to address that and allow myself to stop blocking it so I feel the emotion completely. So I've got to do the same as you. Exactly the same. Diana, this has been... So Diana's next because she's been going... <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> AJ, just talking about that processing bit and, and remorse, and I, I can I, I identify when I'm doing that bartering thing and I yep. recognise that. The bartering with God. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I God's not like good I'm, at bartering. Yeah, yeah, no. no like that, straight out of that. Yeah. But for the law of mercy to take effect, mm -hmm. do we need to actually ask God or does that just naturally happen as we just totally feel that absolute remorse? Well, yes, you do need to ask God um, because you can feel remorse in yourself, that's fine, and you will release emotion and that's fine too and you will progress spiritually by doing all of that. But asking God is about developing your relationship with God. So uh, the way it works for me, and, and I feel probably in the end will work for you as well, is that I talk constantly with God about the emotion. Does that make sense? So, so I, myself and God are in constant dialogue, even when I'm blocked from feeling God. Myself and God are in constant dialogue. I'm always looking, always examining, always feeling my own emotions and talking with God about those emotions. And the... And that is the prayer. The passion of your desire is the prayer. So, so as you're feeling feelings of remorse or repentance, the passion of those feelings, the depth of that remorse directed towards God is the prayer. So you don't have to talk the words. But, but when you are blocked and you're not feeling the emotion, speak the words. Like, you know, talk openly with God. You know, write down how you feel and all those things. And that will help you connect with the feeling. And that's what I do, you know. So Mary and myself, both of you have probably seen carry around notebooks with us and we write down. Myself and Mary, we talk all day pretty much and, and every conversation is either recorded or written down <laughs> um, in the sense that uh, we write down what we've, uh, what we've found like in the process of this emotional work. We write, write it all down and we talk about it with God, talk about feelings with God even if you're not feeling them yet, you can talk about them. Because remember, this is about your relationship with your creator. That's what it's really about. It's not about feeling love from your creator. It's not just about that. Because feeling love isn't a relationship, is it? What's a relationship? Feeling and giving love. That's a relationship now. <laughs> Does that make sense? So, so, so if we're in a relationship with God... We will want to talk with God. We will want to treat God as our best friend. Even when we're totally blocked to the feelings from God, we will want to talk about it. And of course, God can hear us and we can allow this emotional, rela this emotional relationship to develop over time if we, if we engage. Like, there's no other way of developing a friendship, really, with anybody. Like, like myself and Joy, I'm going to get to know Joy by just looking at Joy and saying, yeah, I can see all your emotions. No worries, Joy. See you later. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and Joy just feels like she just got analysed. <laughs> That's about all she's going to feel, isn't it? Yeah. Not going to feel much else unless, <laughs> unless there's some emotional transaction going on between us. A give and take of emotion is what creates a relationship. 
right? where I'm giving emotion, she's receiving that, she's giving emotion, I'm receiving that. And obviously as the, as the emotions increase in love, the intensity of the relationship has the capacity to increase. If, there, if the emotions increase in hatred and fear, then the opposite will occur. The relationship will degrade until we have none or very little link to each other. Can I ask another question? Of course you can. Because it's the one I'm more scared to ask. Is the mic on there properly? Or just hold it a bit closer perhaps, is it? Okay, because I'm too That's scared to ask, so scared to ask it. <laughs> I've just got a lot of fear around letting go of my anger towards men. Mm -hmm. But I sort of really want to do it because I can't get closer to God without that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so you have a fear of letting go of your anger towards men? Yeah, like I, my father developed Alzheimer's and, and um, died and, and then I've got a stepfather who's developed another form of dementia. And... Um, and so, like, I'm feeling more of my emotions around the demanding, unexpressed emotions that are coming from, from men. men. Yep. And I just, like, I'm so sick of it. I'm so over it. Yep. <laughs> and I, like, keep men right away from me because I either don't want men like that around me yep. or only want men that are willing to please women. Yep. <laughs> And even that annoys me and irritates me too. Because so there's a demand in that as well, yeah, isn't there? so I really, I don't have a lot of communication with men at all yeah. because of that. Yeah. And oh, I'm just really, really scared to let go of it because I've been into it a little bit and it's just like I don't exist is how I feel under that. There's two aspects of it though, and one aspect you've identified, and it's great that you're feeling the grief, but there's this other aspect that you haven't identified and yeah, felt. And, I, and that's the aspect of actually you want to hold on to your anger with me. Yeah, yeah I know I have identified that. So there's a part that wants to let go of it and a part that just wants to hold on to it to protect, feels like try to protect myself. Good, so what are you protecting? My vulnerability <laughs> feels like mm. <laughs> what, what's under that. <laughs> Vul is vulnerability an emotion? No, it's just a Isn't state. vulnerability a state? Yeah, it's a state. All right, so okay. So it's not an emotion. So therefore, so whenever I say, oh, I'm not vulnerable, or I feel too vulnerable, it, we're not actually stating an emotion. There's actually emotions underneath the state, right? Um, yeah, that I'm, I'm just really afraid to see it. I'm afraid to feel it. <laughs> well, let's ask the opposite question, and that is, why would you be wanting to hold on to your anger with men? So let's go deeper into this. So um, I can just stay separate. Um, I don't have to take responsibility for what I've done to them or project it onto them. Or it's a bit simpler than all of that. Okay. Right? Yeah, just let yourself feel it if you can just let yourself feel it. Why would I want, and many of you ladies, this is a great question for you to ask too, because many of you ladies are doing this. Why do I want to hold on to my anger with men? Like I want to be in a rage with them. Just give me an excuse to be in a rage with them and I'm in a rage with them. Well, you know, like I'm just waiting, I'm just like, I, I watch him, watch him, watch him. Watch. There's a man that I can be angry with, you beauty. <laughs> and off I, and I'll watch, 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 watch. There's another one, there's another one. I'm going to get him as well. And, and we're just even watching it in the supermarket. Yeah, see him, there. there's another one, you know. And every single man we're wanting to point out, you know, yeah, there's another one, there's another one, there's another one. Like, why am I watching these men so intently wanting to be angry? Like, there's a lot of men that are really nice, but you know what happens with all them? You ignore all them, generally. Right? You don't notice what they did for you. You know, they, one opens the door for you, he should have done that, the stupid idiot. And, <laughs> <laughs> and this is what we have a tendency to do, is because we're watching for men to make the mistake, when men don't make the mistake and they're actually treating us nicely, we don't even really even notice. Right? So that I can reject them. 
So you want to reject them? Yeah, so before they reject me. I want... Yeah, yeah okay, so now, <laughs> can you see? I want to reject them. What else do you want? <laughs> to blame? Yeah. I want to... Annihilate. <laughs> very good, very good. I don't know if that's how you spell it, but let's go. Yeah. Yep, I want them to be wrong. Yeah. yeah. I want them to be wrong. So can you see, it's very helpful yeah. actually. I want them to be wrong about me. Like, because can you see I that? It's just you want to be, judged. you want dad to be wrong about you. <laughs> yeah. 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 So can you, see, can you see what we're often doing is we have a rage towards one or two of the men in our lives that we've not resolved. Or, if it was a man with a woman, one or two of the women in our life that we've not resolved. And what we finish up doing is we finish up projecting that against the entire gender. Right? That's what we do. We project that entire set of emotions towards that entire gender. So, so my mum cheated on my father. So what do we do? We think all women are going to cheat on men. That's what they do. No? My father cheated on my mother. What do we do? We think all men are going to cheat on women. That's what they do. Do you know what I mean? There's an automatic projection of what actually happened in our childhood that's unresolved onto the world around us. And the truth is, in many cases, we want to stay in the place of anger. The place of anger, we become addicted to the place of anger. There is some positives that we feel from the place of anger. When I say positive, I don't feel that positive, but we feel them as positives as we're feeling. And one of the positives is we have total control. That's the positive that many of us are addicted to. Right? So I want to reject men. Men are bastards. We need to recognise that, everyone. Men are bastards. And this is how we feel inside of ourselves. Right? Because, and it might only be that one or two men in our lives were bastards to us and were terrible to us. And often it traces back to, again, how our father treated us or our stepfather treated us or so forth and it's traced back to those events. But, but what happens is that projection then is on the world. We want, to, we want to hold on to this belief because this belief we feel keeps us safe. Does that make sense? Yeah. The reality is we're not accepting one very basic truth and that every belief that's out of harmony with love will create the event we're afraid of. So actually holding on to the belief keeps us the most unsafe we could be. So while I'm holding on to the belief, right, that I want to blame men because, and I'm going to keep my rage and I'm keep my anger with men, I'm going to make sure they all understand that they're just all bastards, right, and I want to hold on to this rage and anger with men, I'm at that point actually going to attract men who are bastards, yeah. right, if we could use that term loosely, yeah. affecting our life and, and causing a lot more pain in our life. That is the most dangerous thing I can do, is hold on to that feeling, that belief. Right? The best thing I can do is actually feel my way through into, I no longer want to hold on to it, I want to feel this emotion inside of me. Now part of it is acknowledging the truth. So part of you dealing with this emotion Diana, is to actually state the truth to yourself. I want to reject the men. I want to blame them. And I don't really give a stuff which man. That's the truth, right? Yeah, that's how I've been feeling. Yeah, yeah, I don't give a stuff which man. It doesn't have to be my dad yeah. who did the damage. It can be my husband or it can be my son even. And I'll still do it. Yeah. Because all men are bastards in the you know what I mean? There's this play that goes on. And what we're avoiding is the actual feeling of talking to the person who created it. So what we're doing when we blame all men is we're avoiding the specifics. We're avoiding going up and talking to the actual man who did the damage. In a lot of cases, it's going to be your dad. You don't want to talk to your dad about it. Why? Well, he might not be in a state where he'll listen, but... You can write to him about it. You can read it out if he's in the spirit world or if he's got Alzheimer's or some other thing like that. You can, when he's asleep, his spirit body is there and he can hear it in the spirit form. So you say it then. Do you know what I mean? You pull yeah, it yeah, say I feel, it like I feel like I've certainly done some of that. Good. And, but it's just like 
there's so much more and so much more. And yeah, Then go the deeper beginning. into the grief of the relationship and express your grief to him, to the man who did the damage. Now, now, if the man who did the damage is still alive and he's still doing damage, he's not going to listen to that very much. So write the letter, express the grief, read it out. Do you know what I mean? Like, do the work that connects you with the grief you feel so that you can release it from yourself. Mm. Right? While you hold on to the rage towards the male and want to, you're not owning the fact that actually you want to damage these men mm. for the damage they gave to you. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, and I've, I've recognised that. And, yep. and because I've seen more of that and it's like I've been pushed up against this wall of I have to deal with this, you know, like and, and I've had a law of attraction, you know, that's with a very condescending, you know, like male. Mm -hmm. Similar and, to Dad was when he was... Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and then, of course, when I'm in this still wanting to be angry and blame... I forget all the things that I know what to do. You just want to focus I, it at that man that's right, I who forget reminds that, you of your dad. Yeah, 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 it's incredible how that... But can you also see how you're avoiding some of the things with your dad? You see, you see, just because a person has Alzheimer's, it doesn't mean you have to look after him. Can she, she doesn't want to look after him. Now, see, what, what happened is a lot of people go, hmm, that didn't sound very loving. Like, if he's got Alzheimer's, you should look after him. We have all these judgments, right? But he's got Alzheimer's, actually, because he doesn't want to remember what he's done to his own daughter. Uh, he doesn't want to feel about what he's done to his own daughter. He doesn't even want to remember what he's done. Right? He's created this disease inside of himself just so that he can avoid the results or consequences of his actions. And the truth is that as a child... We don't have to do anything. A lot of times we make choices because society dictates to us that's the loving thing to do. It's not loving to do something for somebody else when you don't want to do it. Even if you're being unloving by not wanting to do it, it's still not loving. <laughs> do you understand? It's like, if I'm... Let's say, once I deal with all of my emotions, I will want to act lovingly to everyone. Will or not? Even the people who abuse me, I will act loving towards, won't I? But you're not going to manufacture this state. This state has to be a real state, a state that happens inside of yourself after your emotional processing work. Do you follow? So, that bearing in mind, if, if right at this moment I am so angry with my dad that I don't want to have to look after him just because he's got Alzheimer's, the most truthful state to me to be in is to not look after him just because he's got Alzheimer's. Does that make sense? That is the most truthful place to be in that moment. And you can have everyone in the world condemn you for it, but it's still the most truthful place to be. Now, I'm not saying it's the most loving place to be yet because you need to yet deal with some emotion of the rage and anger and all these other things. And once you get out of there, actually, you may still decide not to help Dad who's got Alzheimer's, but you won't be angry about it, right? While there's anger, there's obviously the underlying emotion. But what I'm saying is, why do we take, continue to take actions that we don't want to take and then get angry about them or upset that we're having to do them? We need to be a lot more honest. See, in the spirit world, that doesn't happen. That's one of the good things about the spirit world, particularly in the high spheres. Nobody ever takes an action that they didn't want to do. Now, when you think about it, that simplifies things a lot, doesn't it? So you imagine, you know, tomorrow night, you know, Dad comes home from work and Mum says, I, I don't want to cook dinner. Don't want to have sex with you either. <laughs> and now that I think about it, for the last 10 years, I feel that you've been a demanding bastard and I'm, <laughs> and I'm tired of it. <laughs> Let's imagine for a moment that everybody in the world decided to tell exactly the truth, but every other person they're telling the truth to decided to feel their emotions. Imagine that for a moment. What would happen is you'd have a lot of people feeling their emotions and a lot of people working their way through a lot of things without there being violence and other emotions coming out of them. So, so if we have a parent who's in need of our assistance but we feel angry with them, 
then by assisting them, we're compromising our feeling right at that moment. We're not learning to love ourselves. We're not loving our parent, by the way, either at that moment. We'd be far better off asking somebody else, doing something else to actually make that care happen and, and actually work through our emotion. But I'm not saying ignore the emotion, by the way, here, right? Because the emotion is an unloving emotion and I do need to work through it. But I do need to address the issue. No one has to do anything for anyone. I'm just wondering if there is, in, as we've been created, God created our emotions, all of our emotions, mm -hmm. or our ability to have those emotions. God created your ability to have emotion. Yeah. Spot on. And is there a sort of higher or underlying purpose for the emotion of anger and maybe other apparently negative emotions? All the apparently negative emotions have a higher purpose. And they all have the purpose of exposing your own unlovingness. Does that make sense? So, so every negative emotion, it's, it's what we call negative emotion. Anger is one of them, rage, shame, guilt, you know, fear. All of these emotions are emotions that tell us that we're not being loving. That's the role of them. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks. Do you think... Do you think that rage is a suppressed anger, a lot of angers that haven't been felt, or is rage actually different to anger? Um, I would call uh, there being levels of rage. So you get, you get, you get from irritation, slight annoyance, um, slightly frustrated, and then you get a oh, bit upset, quite annoyed, pretty frustrated, uh, angry, and then you get like violently angry, rageful, resentful, hatred. Right? So, so actually, if I'm in a state of hatred towards anyone, I've actually done a lot of suppression of a lot of that underlying stuff right the way through up to that hatred. Can you talk a bit more about hatred and what, what it actually is? Hatred is the desire to make the other person pay for what they have done. Yeah. For your pain. And usually it's for your pain, but sometimes it can be for a loved one's pain, which really is about your own pain too. Right. So a lot of times we feel like... Um, so, yeah, so I, I don't know if I want to write all that down, but does everyone understand the layers that build up, build up, build up? Every, see, see, anger can't happen without us completely denying our slight annoyance and our frustration. And... and Violent anger cannot happen without us denying our anger. And rage cannot happen without us denying our violent anger. And resentment and hatred cannot happen without denying my violent rage. Right? And all of them are in this category of angry-based emotions. Every one of those emotions tell me when I'm out of harmony with love. So they all have a pure result in the end if I look at them. The pure result being that they'll tell me I'm out of harmony with love. That doesn't justify them, does it? They are the feedback system of the soul telling the soul when it's out of harmony. And that's not a justification of the actual emotion. Yeah. Um, come on. Yeah, keep your hand up and one of them will come to you. There you go. Is it on? Mm -hmm. Thank you, AJ. Um, I'm confused, especially after. If you hold it a bit closer. I'm confused, especially after today. Um, I've been working through a lot of my father issues with anger. Yep. Um, and my, therefore my man issues. Yep. Has and your law of attraction with men changed? Yes. Of course. Yes, but this is what I what I ask about because um, my ex partner, um, like we haven't really been in contact much for a year, um, although we've been separated for three years. We were very friendly for the first two and then we've sort of let go. Mm -hmm. And um, he's saying now that he, he just... So is that his addiction or is it my addiction that he is coming back into his life because I need him or is he my soulmate or what? Because <laughs> I've worked on huge stuff around this lately. Um, 
you're looking again intellectually at something that's happening emotionally. Why, why are you doing that? Like, why, why don't you just trust the interaction? I am. He's There's one of up two things occurring here, isn't there? What are they? What's <laughs> happened with any man issue so far? One of two things. Well, I'm working through them. On one, on one side, there's either a desire to spend time with them or on the other side, there is a emotion that you need to release, is there not? Yeah. That's okay, so I'll tell you, he is coming up. We are going to talk about it because yeah. he's in Victoria and he wants to talk about the divine love part. So I don't know whether he's wanting to come up to stop his loneliness or to really feel that or whether it's my, you know... Why do I you want to know in advance? Well, I'm going to work with it. That's what I'm saying. We are working with it. Yeah, but why do you want to know in advance? I guess I'd really like to know if he's still my soulmate. Okay, <laughs> so get, let's get to the point. Like, this is the question. Yeah, that's a better question. Yeah. Can you see how you skirted around the question? Yeah, but I was confused. As, I was confused. As why well. are you confused? Yeah, is it my addiction or his addiction? No, but see, you're just avoiding the question. <laughs> is he my soulmate or not? That's the question. Yeah, that is the you, question. You're so focused on, is this my addiction? Is this, uh, da, 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 da. And in reality, that's not the question you want to ask. The question you want to ask is, is he my soulmate or isn't he? Yeah. Am I going to tell you? Probably not. No, why? Because <laughs> I need to work through it myself. Because this is an opportunity for you to work through groups of emotions still. Does that make sense? I got more there? Yes. Okay. Of course. <laughs> Are you with a man right now? No. So, you haven't attracted your soulmate yet, is that correct? Well, I was married to that man for, for a lot Doesn't of years. Doesn't matter, he might is be your him? soulmate, you might be attracting him right now. Have you attracted him right now? No, not yet, have you? Your soulmate, I'm talking. Well, I don't know. Is he with you right now? Well, next week he might be. No. <laughs> <laughs> You see, you see, what we often do is we, we often couch our questions, avoiding the real questions. And what you want to do is you want to... A lot of this is he, isn't he, isn't he, isn't he, is just excitement about, in the end, meeting your soulmate. And then wondering, oh, geez, is it somebody I live with for 30 years? If it's like that, then I don't know whether I want that soulmate. <laughs> <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. It's, like, it's like, wow, what if he is, then, oh, gee. Uh, uh, you know. But that's what I thought last week, and I worked through the emotions of that, and now I'm ready, whether he's my soulmate or not, I'm ready to talk with him about it and, awesome. to, feel, and to really help him if he wants to be on the divine love path. Yeah. And I can love him, and yet I'm all ready for it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, but you asked the question in a very convoluted way for a reason. Correct. What was the reason? I don't know. <laughs> what do you think it might be? Maybe I wanted to trick you into ask, answering my question instead of asking it straight out. Yeah. A lot of times what we want is we want a certain piece of information from a person, right? And what we finish up doing is we work out, mm, if I ask that straight out, I know what his answer is going to be because he's done that ten, out, ten other times, right? <laughs> so, so what I'll do in this time is yeah, I'll so ask him a different devious. question and I'll say that I'm confused when I'm not really confused because well, you aren't is. really confused. You aren't. You are just in the process of feeling a few more emotions about the potentiality of this man being your soulmate and whether you have actually dealt with your issues with men. Right? Now, here is an interaction with a man coming up. He happens to be a man that you've had interactions with before. And here is an interaction with a man coming up to help you work through the rest of this stuff. So embrace it. Embrace, I don't mean embrace him and take him to bed. I mean <laughs> embrace the experience of this interaction in harmony with love and truth. Does that make sense? Yeah. The truth is right now, the question I asked you over and over that you kept not wanting to answer is, have you attracted your soulmate right now into your life? The answer is no, because you're minute. not with him right now. Mm. Does that make sense? So that means there is more emotion yet to deal with oh, okay. right, regarding the male. Otherwise, he would already be with you. And by the way, even when he is with you, there's still going to be more emotion to deal yeah. with, which you'll notice once he's with you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But what you need to do is, right, all the emotions that repel my soulmate from me, I am slowly dealing with. This is how it is for you right now. You're slowly dealing with all the emotions that propel your soulmate from you, and sooner or later, you're going to get to the point where you've got no more emotions in you that repel your soulmate. 
and then you'll attract him. And then you'll probably want to either live together or whatever, work through things together. But there'll still be emotions after that with men that you'll still need to deal with. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And, and the question is really a way of avoiding the fact that there is more emotion inside of me to deal with with men. So you see, see, I'm attracting a man into my life and what I want to do is pre-plan the whole experience. Does this sound familiar in your life? Probably. <laughs> okay. Why do we want to pre-plan the experience? Because we are... Afraid. Afraid of something. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of this interaction with, your, with the man who you've known for 30 years? You're af afraid of some things. Yeah? So let yourself feel what you're afraid of. Mm. What is it? I'm afraid that, oh, I've got to accept him being my soulmate and I've known him for 30 years and, and gee whiz, if it's going to be like the last 30 years, it's not going to be very good. So, you know, that's, <laughs> these are the kind of things that we get afraid of, right? Yeah, I've been dealing with those sort of things. Yeah, so yeah let, obviously there's more. Let yourself feel those things. Just let yourself feel your fears. Yeah, and then you'll allow yourself go through the experience, whatever the experience is. Yeah. It, yeah, I think it, I've got to if that. he's not your soulmate, it's going to be lovely that a man yeah. is learning about the divine love path because of his attraction to you. If he is your soulmate, then it'll be lovely because you'll be able to sort out through a lot of emotional th things together, including the emotions of how you felt over that 30 year period you were together. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I'm feeling, all yeah. of those things. Yeah. I feel like I'm in a really happy, good place. It's great, isn't yeah. it? So, why did you ask the question? Can you see there's got to be the fear? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Otherwise you wouldn't ask the question. Yeah. You would just go ahead with the interaction and see what comes up. I guess I'm impatient. Ah, I agree with that, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to know now. <laughs> I want to know right now. <laughs> Do you love me? Do you love me forever? Do you need me? Do you ever need me? <laughs> <laughs> And he can't guarantee all those things, even if he is your soulmate, right? Your soulmate might leave you. He might spend two weeks with you and find, gee, still pretty controlling <laughs> and want to leave you. Do you know what I mean? And, and the truth is we can't pre-plan a lot of these things. And the, the beauty of experiencing the emotion as we go through it is that we will actually get to the causal each time. If we plan things ahead, what we're doing is we're planning to avoid the experience, parts of the experience. Does that make sense? It's a bit like, how, how many of you, when you go on a holiday, you, you book this night and you book that night and you book this night and you book that night and you book this night and that night, and that night. Every night's booked and you know exactly where you're staying, you know exactly what you're going to be doing and all of those things. What that's doing is it, is it makes your holiday really, really comfortable to exactly what you expected it to be. And we often do this with our life. We try. We try to do this with our life. So what we try to do is what? Okay, he's coming next week. So what I do is I spend the next, you know, day, two days, or what I think, how's it going to go? Is it going to go this way? Is it going to go that way? Is it going to go this way, that way, this way, that way? We, we don't understand that all I need to do in the moment is to feel the emotion. And everything will work through. Whatever it is needs to be worked through. And I'll get closer to God out of it. And if he's my soulmate, I'll get closer to him. And I don't need to plan that experience. All I need to do is the same basic thing, and that is feel my stuff right now. So let's feel our stuff right now. Feel our stuff right now. Oh, I'm afraid. I'm afraid he is my soulmate. I'm afraid of that. Well, you know, let yourself feel that. You know, partly that's linked to some unhealed emotion about your relationship during that period. So it's lovely that he's coming because he's going to help you maybe work your way through some of that unhealed emotion. And then, what, what's the other feeling I have? Oh, I want to know who my soulmate is. I'm afraid who my soulmate is. Right? Instead of going, I oh, know, my soulmate's going to be the person. It's the other half of me. Like, if I'm afraid of the other half of me, then I've got quite a few emotions to deal with about that. Does that make sense? Why would you ever be afraid of the other half of you? He's going to be perfect for you when he's dealt with his emotions. Right? And well, then we go, but, but what if he doesn't want to? And that's another fear, isn't it? Well, if he doesn't want to, he's not going to be with you. And he'll feel the pain of that. 
because you won't, because you'll be happy <laughs> if you deal with your emotions. He'll feel the pain of that and he'll go, wow, I don't want to be away from her anymore. <laughs> and he'll come back. That's how it'll go. It's inevitable. Yeah. Because in the end, if we follow this path of one to God, we will inevitab inevitably meet our soulmate and we will inevitably have a relationship with them. It just might take a bit of time yeah, to go past. Mm. No worries. Carol. AJ. It's on. Yep. AJ, you've said a couple of times today that to write a letter and then read it out to someone in the spirit world, don't they hear you if you're just thinking it? They, they do, but, but it's much more powerful for you when you say the words. Okay. You, see, you see, everything I'm trying to get across to you is about you dealing with your emotion. You see, if you say it in your head, there's a higher likelihood that you'll be tuned from the whole process. Right? If you write it all out, you've had one time at actually feeling about it. Then when you read it, you've got another time feeling about it. Do you know what I mean? You're doing it over and over. This is the reason why I've watched some movies for 20 times as well because it triggered me every time until it stopped. So I watched one, leave it a week, watch it again, cry again, watch it again, cry it again. And you know, some of the movies like The Notebook and stuff like that have really triggered me. I've watched 20 times because, because I needed that amount of times to connect with those emotions, like fully connect with those emotions. And it's the same with your interactions with all the pain that's within you about your parents and stuff that have passed. So, so when you're feeling it, write it down. Write down what you're feeling. Don't just think it. Write it all down and then read it out to yourself. Like it's, it's about healing yourself. Read it out to yourself. Read it out to them because they will be present with you. And I'll tell you, reading out to someone who's present with you who did the damage to you is a lot more powerful experience than reading out to the heap of people who think everything's fine, right? Or who think you're fine, you know? So allow yourself to feel their projections, their anger, their rage, or whatever else they're feeling. Allow yourself to experience all of that. That's a part of dealing with these emotions. One of the main reasons why we do not address our emotions with our parents is because we are afraid of their reaction. And instead, you know what we do? We go and choose a man or a woman who's not going to react that way, and we project all of the stuff that we should be projecting at our parents to that man or woman, thinking it's going to heal us, and it's not, because we're still afraid of our parent. And so the best person to deal with, if you can, is directly with the parent. And that applies whether they're past or not. Now, it's quarter to six, so time goes fast for me anyway when I'm having fun. Um, so um, what I wanted to do just in the last few minutes is just explain some things to you about what we're planning over the coming few months, uh, so, that, so that you're aware of what's going on. Um, Mary was going to run some workshops down here, and we've actually decided not to run workshops down here because we've actually decided that we're not going to personally run workshops at all. Um, what we're going to do, well, when I say not personally run workshops at all, what we're going to do is not run workshops for the public specifically at all, what we're going to do is something different. And the reason why is there's so many people now who are coming to know the divine love path that it's impossible for myself and Mary to give personal assistance to those people. So that's wonderful. You know, that's a wonderful thing. So what we've decided to do instead of doing what we were originally planning is we've decided to... Um, to invite people who we feel um, are ready to be of assistance to others, who are really, I'm going to use the word, to, ready to be other people's servants on purpose, um, who are ready to serve others. And what we're doing is we're inviting them and we're, we're going to go through with them what it means to be being of service. And then after we've done that, we will actually be developing a series of different uh, workshops on different subjects, some of which will be to do with the relationship stuff. So some of it will be uh, uh, attracting your soulmate, for example, relationships and all those, uh, how to have a relationship with someone who's not on the path and you still love them and want to be, you know, be in a loving relationship with them. 
um, things like uh, how to still opening to God, like Mary has already developed, and a number of other workshops, um, all sorts of, sorry, parenting workshops as well, and also mediumship, uh, specific mediumship workshops. But what we're going to do with them all is we're going to develop the sort of the process and the outline of the workshop itself. And then we're going to run that workshop with the people we've selected who we feel might have a desire or a longing to eventually run that workshop themselves. Does that make sense? But they're going to have to be in a very sp specific place of humility and so that's why we're selecting those particular people. And by the way, our selections of those people are not... Uh, there's no favouritism involved, as many people will start realising after a while. It'll be dependent totally on the person's personal condition as to whether they're invited to come. Then what we'll do is present that workshop to them with them as a participant of the workshop. And then we'll invite them to actually run the work, one of those persons who, who actually get that material the best in the workshop to run the next workshop with us sitting in the audience of the workshop. Does that make sense? And giving them feedback and everything. Because what we're trying to do is we want to prepare a group of people who are ready for the next influx of people coming along to the divine truth. Right? And, what we want, and so we know personally that it's impossible for us to act personal assistance to everybody. Um, in fact, it's impossible for one person on this path to do their own emotional work and really give personal assistance proper personal assistance to any more than 20 or 30 people generally, right? And so what we're trying to do is enable it so that those persons who have worked through different areas, and it's not always going to be the same areas, and they'll work through different areas and who have a passion to teach in different areas and who have a passion to be of service to people for nothing, for free, for, no, for nothing back, and those kind of people we want to help get into the condition where they can be of that service. Now, as time improves, what will happen is there will be this happening in all sorts of areas and facets of life, not just in terms of having a seminar or, or, those kind, or, or workshops, but actually in terms of building programs and showing people how to build like things like uh, adobe houses and all sorts of things. There's going to be a wide variety uh, down the track of all sorts of things that will all be in harmony with divine love and divine truth that we want to sort of show people what to do and have a team of people ready for the next group of people to be able to show them what to do and how to work their way through their emotional work and everything like that. So, so this is part, over the next, uh, we feel it's going to be an ongoing pro uh, issue uh, and process and eventually what we want to have is thousands of people who are ready to help others for nothing. Right? and just will rely on their law of attraction to survive, just like myself and Mary are, and doing the same things that we've been doing. And our role will be more helping, helping those people who are helping others. Um, it would be far more of that. So while we're still going to be doing seminars where we talk to the public, uh, on, with workshops, we won't be personally running the workshops with the public. We'll be running workshops for those people who will be running the workshops for the public, if that makes sense. Um, sort of like, yeah, being mentors and helping a whole group of people get into the condition where they can actually help others. And so we feel really excited by that. Both Mary and myself feel really excited about that. And we're looking forward to having the opportunity to work with a group of people who we know are open and humble. And, uh, and we're also looking forward to the opportunity of hearing your feedback about what they do with you, you know, what that, in terms of what those people do who get to that position. Uh, and, and it's not a position, actually. It's a place of service. And, uh, and, and it would be great to hear from you about how that goes. Because in the end, what we want is the ability for thousands and thousands and thousands of people to be assisted at the same time. And, and we, can't, we can't make that happen without, without a group of people having a desire to be of assistance um, themselves. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so uh, we will notice you, we will invite you if you're, if, if, to be a part of that and uh, if you feel you're not being noticed, have a look at the emotion, you know, like <laughs> that's going on there. Because, because the truth is that everyone that we meet 
uh, we have very specific feelings about uh, and we can feel your emotional condition quite easily and, and so it's easy to feel the humility that's there or, or the lack of humility that's there if it's, if it's converse to that. Um, and we really do want to have the people who are running these help, helping sessions to be in a very strong state of humility, a very strong state of really being open about their own condition, open about their own progress, knowing how to feel their own emotions. And also it's very important that they know how to feel other people's emotions uh, really well as well. And also in many cases that they've had the personal experience of doing what they're teaching. So in other words, with the parenting ones, then obviously these, the people who will be doing it will be people who have experienced the parenting emotions as they've dealt with their own children on the divine love path. Does that make sense? And the people who run the stuff with getting together with their soulmate will be soulmate couples who have actually met their soulmates through the process of their own growth over the last few years. With the people who will be uh, running the stuff to do with living with a partner who's not on the path and, and living in harmony and with love, in love with them, and they will be people who are living with their partner on the, who's not on the divine love path but living in a loving relationship with them. Does that make sense? And so and that, that then means that every one of those people have the ability to give you from, from their own personal experience as well um, the, the, the information. So, so that we're looking forward to that happening and that's probably one of the main things that we're wanting to do. The other thing that we're thinking of doing, and this is not for certain, so please don't write everything down in concrete about this, but we are thinking of having a bit of a road trip, myself and Mary. Um, there are groups uh, ranging from Mildura, Melbourne, right the way up through the ranges, you know, like Bathurst and Dubbo and and then up through, through past here, Armadale, here, Coffs, and then as you go up north there's groups now that have started up in, in locations in, around Kingaroy and then across at the coast in the Sunshine Coast. There's now groups also starting up in Mackay, Townsville. And so what that means is that we would like to actually visit them right? and uh, have a chat with all of those groups. So, so that's going to mean probably myself and Mary jumping in a vehicle with a sound system or two and, <laughs> and, uh, and actually going and visiting those locations over the next uh, few months. And what we were thinking of doing actually was visiting a location and hopefully by then we've had some of these workshops developed and we've got some people who want to travel with us and what we'll do is visit the location and maybe do a talk like this and then the next few days some of the seminars happen at that location. So what that means is you get a talk and then a day or two day uh, help on a different area that affects you personally. And, uh, and we're, we're thinking we'll probably start in Mildura or something like that and then go sort of down to Melbourne and then around up the coast. So it'll be a month or two, uh, it, sorry, it'll be a couple of months or, or maybe even a longer trip uh, away. So that's what we're planning. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll, over the next three or four months, see you again um, here in Coffs. And, uh, and also at that point have with us some of those people who can run some of those um, workshops that we were talking about. Uh, and, uh, and you'll see the experience, you'll have the experience of meeting those people who have been on the path for a much shorter period of time than myself and Mary. And, uh, and therefore, you'll have the experience of seeing their growth, you know, and, and meeting new people from other locations as well. So hopefully that will uh, be an interesting experience as well for, for many of you. So that's our plans. Hopefully uh, you'll enjoy those plans as they go ahead. We'd like to thank you for your donations too. Um, uh, your donations uh, go a long way for us. We're, we're getting a lot of things done now and... There's a lot of uh, DVDs now getting produced and there's 5,000 now getting produced at, at a time and so that, that means uh, and we're producing them at quite cheap rates now because we've got a lot of volunteers who are helping in the process and, and so what that means is we'll be able to eventually come to a place like, uh, like this with a whole suite of free DVDs for you to take home with you as well, uh, which we're looking forward to. Uh, being able to do. 
Um, you wanted to say that you've got a list up the back there. Um, do you want to just grab a microphone uh, wherever that is? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, we're producing a lot of DVDs on the Gold Coast, and we put together a whole pack, so the whole 96 DVDs that are out so far. Um, I brought half a dozen this today. Uh, there's one left. Um, but if you would like one, and especially if you're going to be at Udla in a couple of weeks or we can bring it down next time, just write your name down the list. And that's where you get the whole, it was over 100 DVDs, 96 DVDs, for free, it's all free. Um, and, uh, and it's the efforts of people like Joy that have been involved in producing a lot of, there's a whole team of people that are doing all of this for you, like that's their gift to you. And uh, so, so express your thanks to them when you get the opportunity for the gift that they're giving to you. Mary, you want to? Just, um, we just love it so much seeing people getting into their passion and then doing all of these things and what's happening. There's so many things happening now. It's really, really good. And, and, and things are popping up all over the world at the moment. Like there's all these different opportunities popping up all over the world and there's a lot of people now starting to uh, make decisions about their life rather than just sitting on the information. Like they're making choices in their life and that's really exciting for us to watch. So, uh, yeah, we just really um, are enjoying the time at the moment. Um, coming up over the, over the next year or two, obviously things may change a little and um, also we have been told but we also feel that um, there'll be things like very bad media coverage about myself and Mary coming up. And um, so we just wanted to give you a heads up that uh, there are a lot of spirits behind a bit of a smear campaign that um, they want to begin. They haven't begun it yet, really, uh, but, but that will begin uh, over the coming months. So that will test out a few people's trust and faith and in the information they're receiving as well. My feelings are... Um, Can we help with that? Like, help to push that spirit's away? Well, um, perhaps just as an, as an end of this discussion, if I can explain to you how spirits hook into you. What they do is, here's your spirit body, right? So, yours, right? <laughs> Bit chubby, this one, sorry about that. Um, and here's your soul. All right, surrounding. Now, in your soul are a whole group of emotions, some of which are harmonious with love and some are not. Now, the ones that are not harmonious with love are seen as cracks and fissures in your body. Does that make sense? So what happens is a spirit who's malevolent sees only those things. So, so, for instance, if you can't speak the truth to others because you're afraid of what they'll think of you, then this area of your body will have a problem in it that, you're, that a spirit can see. Does that make sense? So what they will do then is they'll put you in situations where you speak lies because you can't speak the truth. And they, what they get out of that is see your condition go downhill. That's what they get out of it. The joy of destroying someone else. Right? Now, they also see where you have different belief systems that all have marks all over your body. In fact, anybody who can see the aura completely can describe these marks and, and problems with your body. But every single one of these problems is allowing a spirit to manipulate you in some way if they choose to. And what we're finding is that a lot of spirits are focusing their attention on people who know myself and Mary through these you know, seminars and that and working on their Achilles, heel, Achilles heels, if you like, their, their emotional problems to try and manipulate them into taking courses of actions which are quite um, damaging both to others but also their goal is for it to be damaging to myself and Mary. That's their underlying goal. And so what you can do certainly is just work on your emotions. Work on the, work on the feelings inside of you where you compromise truth. Work on the stuff where you compromise love. Don't compromise love anymore. Don't compromise truth anymore. Deal with the addictions you have. If it's an addiction for popularity, deal with that. If it's an addiction for being heard, deal with that. 
if there's an addiction for telling little fibs because people notice you, deal with that. Do you know what I mean? Let yourself deal with those emotions because the more of those emotions you deal with, the less anyone is going to be able to influence you, spirits or otherwise. Some of you have deep fears about your personal safety. And that is a definitely big addiction that many spirits work on constantly. Because when you have an addiction to your own personal safety, you are willing often to compromise love and truth in interactions with others. Right? And, and the key is to understand that when I bring myself into harmony with God's laws and principles, I am more protected in that location than I can ever afford my own protection. So, so quite often we're making choices and decisions where we compromise truth and love, thinking that it's going to protect us more, but in reality what it finishes up doing is creating events that damage us more. It's the only time we're going to be fully protected, really, in a, in a complete sense, is when we deal with all the emotions that cause us to act out of harmony with truth and love. And when we're in that space, now we have the full protection, the full force of our celestial friends, the, the spirits above the eighth sphere, and the full force of God's protection can be given to us depending on free will, of course. That's the time when we have afforded the most protection in our lives. Right? Now that doesn't mean we might not die. It just means that in the end it will be okay. That's what it means. And a lot of us are addicted to a, a fear, uh, to, to getting away from the fear of our own death. And you can see why, can't you? The, most of the planet is addicted to getting away from the fear of their own death. Look at how we handle funerals even. But there's proof of it there, right there. So if you can allow yourself to deal with these different emotional addictions, that is going to be the thing that helps the most. And it won't, we're not asking for your help for us. That's the thing that's going to help the planet the most. You know, everyone around you, every time you release an emotion, a causal emotion in you that's damaging the planet around you, automatically now everyone around you benefits from that healed emotion. That's a wonderful gift you can give to other people. So, and to yourself, of course. Yeah. Can we use the mic? Is that right? Yeah. I don't know. I can't hear it. If you hand it over here, we'll... right. power has to be on and the mute off. Yep, use that one. Um, if we come across that sort of press that you were talking about, the mm -hmm. negative stuff, mm -hmm. um, can we respond to it like... Why? Okay. That's not necessary to do that. No, no. All that's necessary is to feel your own emotions about the press. Do, okay. you, do you know what I mean? Like, um, you know, in a hundred DVDs, by now you would know a bit of my character, even yep. if you haven't spent time with me personally, right? Mm. So, so you know those things. You know what I've been teaching. So when you see something being said about us that, that, that isn't accurate or isn't true, just feel your feelings about it. That's what it's there for, to trigger your feelings. So feel your feelings about it. You know that real rage that comes up in you? Oh, that's so unjust. Yeah. Feel that feeling. And then yeah. go to the underlying feeling of what does that feel like underneath that? Oh, the grief of my own life, of how I've yeah. been treated unjustly. Yeah. Feel that feeling. Release yeah. that. But also don't be afraid to speak the truth. But don't go on a program of okay. trying to do it. Do you know right. what I mean? Yeah. Because that's driven by an unhealed emotion of wanting justice. Okay. And at the end, yeah. myself on. and Mary don't want justice. Mm. We just want to demonstrate love and give the gift of love. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, so, so perfectly. We don't need anybody to fight for us or any of those things. What we need is everyone to feel their stuff about what happens over the coming months. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, that's the most, thank you. That's the most powerful thing. And, and honestly, um, 
One of the things you may or may not be aware of, one of the things we've become very aware of over the last couple of years, is how much disinformation there is, how much effort there is by spirits to provide disinformation and therefore by a lot of people to provide disinformation to the planet. Like what they want to do is focus on different areas, even of your life they will eventually, focus on different areas of your life and they'll say, oh, she did this in the past. And what's that got to do with now in the end? Like, even if you were, you know, a prostitute who murdered people in the past, what's that got to do with what you are now if you've healed all of that emotionally? Nothing. Does that make sense? And so what we need to come to terms with is that we need to realise that any attack that comes is just a law of attraction event to help us deal with some more emotion and get ourselves into a more loving space inside of our, ourselves. So these are great ways for us to deal with our fears, deal with our terror of attack, deal with our feelings of injustice, deal with all of these things. They're all fantastic ways to deal with all of those things. And if we allow ourselves to go through it, we'll come out of it closer to God, closer to each other emotionally. We, we will know that this isn't a cult, this is just a way of life. You know, At the end of the day, being with God is a way of life. And it's got nothing to do with me. It's got everything to do with God and you. And anything that happens along these lines is going to help you develop that relationship. And the key is to, is to don't avoid confronting situations. Don't avoid them. You don't notice me avoiding those confronting situations. I stand up for them. Stand up for truth when you have given the opportunity. But you don't need to go out on a vendetta telling, you know, trying to undo the lies. You know, if I spent all the time trying to undo the millions of lies that have been told about me during my 2,000 years of existence, like I would be spending the rest of my life doing it. And the truth, the important truth, would not be told. All we need to do is focus on that truth. So every time, you know how sometimes when people say things about you that are wrong, you never did, and you know how you feel, you know, you feel like eh, unjust, you know, feel a bit angry towards the person. Well, all of those emotions are preventing you from being at one with God, right? So allow yourself to experience them, but get underneath them and into the grief of that and release those things because we need to release them if we want to be in this place of perfection of our love. And if we do that, what will happen is we'll, we'll come out of these things stronger, more, more cl closer to God, more resilient within ourselves as a person, and with a lot more joy than we even currently have. That's what, how we'll come out if we focus on dealing with the underlying emotions. But if we focus on the events and the situations and na 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 at that person, tell that person off and criticise that person, and correct that person, we're going to be finding that our attention is being drawn away from our own self. Our attention is going to be drawn away from our own development. The more I can distract you as a spirit, if I'm a spirit, the more I can distract you from your own development, the happier I am. Right? So don't fall into the trap of getting distracted from your own relationship with God, ever. No matter what pressure is happening around you, focus on, focus on that first. Don't get distracted about your own relationship with your partner. You know, those are the two most important relationships you can develop your entire life. So don't let other things distract you from them. No matter how oppressive those other things may seem to be, deal with the emotions of them, but stay focused. This is about you, God, and you be becoming the person God created you to be. Hmm. So we thought we'd give you a bit of heads up with that. The reason why we've had quite a lot of spirits come and talk to us about the coming things and myself and Mary's a bit freaked about a lot of them and aren't you darling? It's just going to help you work through some stuff, yeah. Um, so sometimes some spirits come and tell us what's going to happen in the future, and sometimes we get just as freaked as you do about that. <laughs> and we need to work through our own emotions about that. Mm. So that's uh, that's that's us for the day. Um, we're up at Butterham next weekend, so uh, up at the sunny coast. Um, in Queensland, yeah. would you like us to? They wanted us specifically to, to where well, they knew we were coming down, and they wanted us to send you their love and and feelings. So that's 
what they wanted. So there were 200. Send them back. There were 200 people who said that to you. So, um, and some of them you may know, but a lot of you have probably never met these people. But they're all were very mindful of everyone else who's uh, who's listening and 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 developing emotionally as well. So, I'll take your love back with us to them as well. How's that sound? Thanks for your time, guys. Thanks.